Our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Walker, DVM, PhD. I first met Dr. Walker when she was in my dairy production medicine class at UC Davis um, just a couple years ago. So after she graduated, she was in dairy practice in the Central Valley, California, and as an associate veterinarian. And in 2005, she and her husband, who is also a dairy veterinarian, moved to Columbus, Ohio, where they both pursued PhD degrees in preventive medicine. Jen's work focused on mastitis and milk quality, and in particular, staph, ori staph aureus. As I've come to know Jen, even as a veterinary student, she was a vocal advocate for cows, and in her current position, she serves as director of dairy stewardship, a new position developed by Dean Foods. In her capacity in that work, she works with retailers who handle Dean Foods products and their customers, and she also works with producers who ship directly to Dean's plants, as well as representatives of dairy co-ops from which Dean buys their milk. So please welcome Dr. Jen Walker. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate the invite and I'm admittedly grateful to be considered, I consider this a great company and grateful uh, for Dale's introduction. It's, it's really fun to kind of make this full circle because I'll admit um, having Dale and her husband Bill as professors are one of the main influences of how I got more involved in education and outreach and decided when I was a student that that was the kind of educator I wanted to be and how do I take that and apply that at the farm. So it's an honor to be back. Um, so today I, I want to share with you sort of my perspective of animal welfare, maybe from more of a dairy perspective, how it's changed over the years. Um, and maybe how I understand um, the, the, my perception of animal welfare programs here in the U.S. and what I've gleaned from listening to, to these sort of folks over the years. When we look at animal welfare audits or assessments, I think you know, our impression is they're really meant to provide assurance to customers and our consumers that animals and agriculture are properly cared for. So over the next few minutes, we're going to talk about whether or not we've actually been successful at that. We're going to look at some of the hurdles that are present in actually trying to achieve that goal. I think so far today we've had a great education from, I think again, some of the best in the fields from, from Candace to Charlie to David. Um, and so I'm not going to rehash what I usually present in my presentation. I'm going to steal, with them, steal from them a little bit to remind you what we've talked about today. Um, it's a good thing Candace and Charlie left because I've pretty much stolen everything from them, um, with permission of course. Um, before I get started, I, I want to give you a, just a little bit of introduction of sort of where I'm coming from and, and sort of a, a perspective of when I think of animal welfare and really where I think our most profound effect on the, the welfare of animals actually is. <clears throat> so I'll take a moment and introduce you um, uh, uh, to Lenny. So this was a cat I met, short for Leonardo da Vinci, because he was missing an ear at the time. This is a representation of a cat that I met when I was about 16 years old and I was working at my local animal shelter. Vinny had been set on fire by a couple of local teenagers. And at that age, I learned two important lessons that were going to set me up for the rest of my veterinary career. The first lesson was that it takes a great amount of courage to forgive. The second lesson is that everything happens through people. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how good of a veterinarian I would ever become, if I cannot affect the attitudes of people towards animals, I would spend the rest of my life treating minis. That's not what I wanted to do. How do we affect change? How do we change the attitudes of people? Now, this would seem like a relatively easy task to get into if you were a people person. You can ask Dale privately and she'll probably tell you, Jen's really not much of a people person. <laughs> Given the opportunity, I usually select the company of animals over the company of people. So I've had to learn. I've had to learn how to interact with people. I've had to learn how to communicate. Learn to see the individual while still looking at the herd. And I think as a profession, I see a lot of young veterinary students in the room, I think it's exciting. As a profession, we need to learn how to communicate on the farm and with consumers about what compassion looks like. We need to learn to communicate how to affect change in the attitudes 
of the people we work with and the people that work with these animals that we benefit from. <clears throat> I begin with this slide because I think it's a nice reminder. You, many of you might be familiar with it. I think it was like an 1822 quote from W.D. Horde. Okay? It's a great reminder to me that there's really nothing new about animal welfare. Animal welfare is what we've always been about in animal agriculture. And we shouldn't shy away from using the word. We need to stop substituting it with words like animal care and animal well-being. I heard somebody refer to it as animal wellness once, and I thought I just had visions of cows doing yoga in my head. <laughs> so, so animal welfare should be at the top of mind of every veterinarian and every dairyman. In fact, it should be at the top of mind of anyone involved in buying animal products. I think many people sort of presume that understanding and promoting animal welfare would sort of be the natural position of any veterinarian. But in reality, we've only begun to introduce the topic of animal welfare in the veterinary curriculum. Many colleges still don't even address it. So when it comes to our profession, it really is a new territory. What we're now facing, if food processors and food marketers are going to remain viable, that is sustainable, we're going to have to make sure that we successfully tend to issues of animal welfare. That is our new reality today. Now how successful we are at this will depend more than on our veterinary expertise. It will depend on how we empower the people we work with to promote the welfare of animals. And that requires that we have a clear understanding of animal welfare and all that it encompasses. We have to understand how our view of animals has changed. It's changed dramatically over the last 50, 60 years. The roles that animals play in our lives has changed in a profound way in how people look at animals in our lives and how they expect <coughs> us to take care of them. <clears throat> we talked a lot today about what consumers think about and how they're influenced. We looked at where they are today and, and try to explain <clears throat> how they view animal welfare. When I think about animal welfare and I try to explain it to the farmers and how things have changed over time, I, I introduce the idea of what's called the moral circle. So what is the moral circle? Well, I find that sometimes when we start talking about animal welfare, people say our ethics are changing. So much has changed. We think <coughs> different ethically. I would argue that we haven't. Our ethics haven't changed at all. The golden rule is still the golden rule. It's to whom we extend consideration of the golden rule that has changed. We have expanded our moral circle. I also think that some people tend to think that with that expansion of the moral circle, some folks have achieved some higher sense of morality. I would say that that's also untrue, and we'll address that in a minute. So, when I talk about the moral circle, I think we don't have to look too far back in our history to be a little embarrassed by the fact that many people used to function in this moral circle. Today we've moved forward, and I'm happy to say that most of us function at least in this moral circle, while many folks, again, have expanded their moral circle to consider companion animals and farm animals and others. The important thing to recognize is once these animals have entered someone's moral circle, they expect them to be cared for in a way that's congruent with their values and beliefs. And that has a profound effect on how they view what we do in agriculture. Again, I kind of joke around. Some folks are here with their moral circle. My crazy aunt is way there with her dogs and animals. <laughs> so, again, I, I talked about the fact that some people kind of look at that and say, okay, so someone who has an expansive moral circle, well, they must just be so much holier than that than I am. And again, I say I disagree. And, and to prove the point here, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll share with example <clears throat> a story about me, my dad, and my cat. When it comes to moral circles, my dad would be right about here, okay? 
He's a good guy. Love him to death. I respect him. He has good core values. I still go to him today for advice. Okay? He's a good man. But this is about where he is. He grew up on a farm. He likes cats and dogs just fine. He certainly wouldn't think you should ever neglect or abuse an animal. But when it comes to animals, he would see them as what I would call a means to an end. They're here for our use. We can benefit from them. And in benefiting from them, we owe them food, shelter, water, those sorts of things. Okay? My moral circle, probably more about that. Some days of the week, the dog kind of falls out of the moral circle, depending on what kind of trouble she's gotten into. <laughs> Okay, so we have two people raised, my dad raised me, we live in the same house. How, do, how does my moral circle influence his behavior? How does the moral circle of other people influence the rest of society? Well, here's our example. Dale had a picture of her cat up earlier in the day. This is the best cat in the world, by the way. So <laughs> I went. So this, this is Smokey. He was the first cat and only cat I was ever allowed to have as a kid. The reason was my, my parents weren't really pet people. Again, I said my dad was raised on a farm. To him, animals were work and responsibility. That, that's what they represented. When he grew up, you fed the cows before you fed yourself. He just wasn't interested in having to deal with that at the house. My mom was a little different story because she was essentially California's answer to Martha Stewart, okay? The you know, neat, tidy cooking version, not the orange prison suit version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so dogs and cats are smelly and messy and she didn't want him around. Yet somehow I convinced my parents that I needed a cat. So we found this kitten on a camping vacation and we brought it home. Now, unfortunately, a few years into this, this relationship, Smokey found himself in a bit of a pickle. So we were gonna have to go to the veterinarian. Before we headed out to the veterinarian, my dad sat me down and he said, Jennifer, I'm telling you right now, we're not spending a lot of money on this cat. And I said, okay, let's go. Sat in the vet and we waited nervously. Had the cat in my lap. As the veterinarian came to get the cat for me, I started crying like an absolute freak. My dad, frustrated, took a deep breath, took the cat from my lap, walked up to the, vet the veterinarian and said five simple words. Please make her stop crying. <laughs> That is the influence of the moral circle. $500 later, all was good. Okay? So these things don't have to be adversarial. These, the fact that, that I feel a little differently about the role of animals in my life doesn't have to play such an adversarial role against folks who, who feel a little bit differently. I think there's a way to reach a common ground. But it's important to think and recognize how those differences affect behavior and choice. So for those of you who missed the morning session or, or, or maybe took a nap, um, I'll give you the, the, the cliff notes of our welfare conversation so far today. It's about more than science. It's about more than economics. It's fundamentally about ethics. It's about understanding that moral circle and how it's influenced. We'll keep running into that. And we need to reconcile that ethical knowing is different from other knowing. It's not like math. It's not meant to describe how the world is. It's meant to describe how the world ought to be. We need to reconcile that. It may not be based solely on feelings, but it does begin with some basic ethical assumptions. The golden rule is a great example. We have to recognize the fact that it's not enough to ask, can we do something? We have to ask, should we do something? To answer these questions, we need to all work together to develop a better understanding of welfare and all that it encompasses. And we've had a great start today. We need to recognize that good production does not necessarily guarantee good welfare. We can no longer defend our agricultural practices with pounds. 
because it's not always true. It also makes us appear pretty ingenuine. We also need to recognize that farmers are confronted with ethical decisions every day. Not everything we decide can be boiled down to economics. Great example, <clears throat> that three-legged lame cow that's still milking 60 pounds. Maybe it's 45. Whatever it is, it's enough that you know, she's still paying for her feed cost and everything else. Once her production's low enough, she's been lame for a while, now she's lost weight, she's a body condition score less than two. The decision of whether or not that cow gets put on a trailer and whether or not that cow is euthanized on the farm is an ethical decision. We need to get together and develop some guidelines, some tools to help farmers make these decisions. Because those are the cows that end up on the video, those are the cows that end up at the slaughterhouse, and those are the cows that get us in trouble every time. So we need to work on that. Now we can spend a lot of time debating on how exactly to define animal welfare, and again, I think we had some great stuff today. But in reality, the exact definition probably is, isn't as important as understanding what it encompasses. And, and folks talked a lot today about how this was sort of our old animal welfare definition in animal science, the body, basic health and functioning. But we know now that it's more than that, okay? We talked a lot about that today. And we talked about how it's a balance. We have to balance these three things. Nothing ever takes necessary priority and it's a give and take. We need to recognize that that perfect intersection would be what I would call bliss, which I think we all know is, is rarely achieved and when it is, is often short-lived. So it's striking to achieve that balance. So to help out those of you still kind of struggling to understand maybe all that welfare encompasses, beyond these traditional methods of efficiency, production, how do we measure welfare? Beyond measuring lameness, hygiene, body condition, what else do we need to consider? Like we've talked about today, we can look at an animal's extent or failure to cope we can look at stress. We can look at abnormal behavior. We can look at motivation. We have ways to ask the animals what they prefer. We can ask them what matters most. All of these elements are important factors affecting the welfare of animals. And I recognize that today we don't have necessarily the best way to measure them or ask the right questions. But if we don't first acknowledge that they're very important, we never will. So this has been a good day. Um, I think it's been a great opportunity. And as I was sitting here and thinking about this last night, it reminded me of about a month ago, I was at a similar meeting in Arkansas. And, um, <clears throat> We had kind of the same conversations going, and everybody was really positive, and I was getting really stoked up. I was kind of sitting there next to Ken, it's like, you know, we're making progress, we're gonna do this. And then, all of a sudden, the final closing speaker got up to kind of summarize his thoughts on the day on gestation crates. And what he said essentially equated to a, simil a, a quote I read from David Warner, the spokesman, for the National Pork Producers Council, who said, so our animals can't turn around two and a half years that they're in stalls producing piglets. I don't know who asked the sow if she wanted to turn around. The only real measure of her well-being is we have the, the, the number of piglets per birth, and that is at an all-time high. Okay? Then I had to wonder, was anybody paying attention? Are we even paying attention? Because we seem to always fall back to this. And I don't get it. I think we've had a great day where people have showed us there's more than the number of piglets. It's more than the number of pounds. And we have to move forward and start incorporating that in how we approach welfare. And then I open dairy herd management and I see this. You're the expert, okay? Am I surprised that Purdue found in a consumer survey of over a thousand people that they said HSUS was the go-to expert on animal welfare. 
They tied with other. I will say that. And I had hope that other might have been veterinarian, because if you'll notice, veterinarian's not in the pie chart. <laughs> okay? Of the 215 people that said other, 140 indicated that they don't have a resource or pretty much they don't look for one. So if we're lucky, okay, I'm, I'm the optimist for my profession, if I'm lucky, the remaining others, that would be 75, were veterinarians, and that would leave us at a whopping 7%, which is actually less than the government. A little concerned, okay? And then we turn around and tell ourselves that we're the experts. You're the experts. Well, what does an expert look like when it comes to animal welfare? What do we do as animal welfare experts? Let's look at our history. 2008, the Hallmark plant kind of started the whole thing off. ABP officials characterized images of the video as deplorable. ABMA responded with an editorial that called for the strictest penalties if the allegations are confirmed. By the way, we need more veterinarians. What did we expect people would, we would say? Like, of course we're gonna say this. We're not gonna say we condone it. Wasn't anything really here, was there? It was what the public expects us to do that really matters. The public expects that we wouldn't have actually allowed this to happen in the first place. That's the problem. Okay, 2011, we had, we had time figure some stuff out. And I'm not meaning to throw ABP under the bus here. This goes across the profession, but these were the quotes I had. So, 2011, we're at it again. We have a video out of Dalhart, Texas on a calf ranch. The ABP condemns will for acts of abuse. We promote, we strongly promote humane care and handling, okay? Again, what do you think we were expected to say? I don't care, you know? Of course we don't condone it. What are we doing about it? What are we doing as a profession to prevent this? Had a year to go. California, Hallmark all over again. This time, we unequivocally condemn it. Okay? What are we accomplishing? So should we be surprised that the food service industry and the grocery industries are trying to come up with their own programs? I'm not. Not when all we have to offer is, you shouldn't have done that. Okay? It kind of reminds me of that uh, Robin Williams stand-up routine where he pokes fun at the, the British police officers and says, like, what do they do if they run into a robber? You know, yell stop, or I'll yell stop again. Okay? Because they can't carry firearms, by the way. So, I'm beginning to think we're becoming the punchline. All we do is yell stop. What are we doing as a profession to address the problem? So, while we yell stop, corporations have a brand at stake. And maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's why we're finding that corporations and companies are running out ahead and say, I gotta fix this problem. Because I have a brand that's going to get thrown under the bus, not just an organization. I was hired by Dean Foods back in 2010 because they, like many other companies, have recognized that with every relationship along the supply chain, there is risk. And that relationship goes all the way back to the farm. And that's a risk. We need to identify the risk, and we need to manage the risk. We need to protect the brand. It's also about doing the right thing. Okay? They expect us to do the right thing. But if all we're going to do is yell stop, or I'll yell stop again, there's not a lot of confidence that that's going to really serve the purpose. Now, when I think of my role as a veterinarian, <clears throat> particularly a dean, in dealing with animal welfare, I try to sort of simplify it to, to wrap my head around it. And I look at animal welfare on a continuum from bad to really good. Beyond that, we have this extra little special thing that kind of gets people's hackles up sometimes where we, we start going down these, ideal, what I will refer to as ideological paths, okay? 
you'll notice that my welfare arrow stops there. I'm a firm believer that we can achieve good welfare in any farming system. Why? Because everything happens through people. It's the people that make the difference in the system. Good people can do great things with any system. The wrong people can make a disaster in even the best of systems. Okay? So how do we work through the supply chain to provide our customers and consumers confidence that we are doing the right thing? This goes back to what Charlie talked about today. We are a little different here in the U.S. Unlike the European Union, where welfare programs were implemented in response to concerns for food safety, animal welfare programs in the U.S. were really developed for two reasons, risk mitigation and niche marketing. Now, efforts made by these special interest groups have focused on compromising consumer trust. That's what they're trying to do. Because they, they, they know everything that Charlie talked about today. They know exactly that story. So they know where they got to aim. They understand that that trust has a foundation in shared core beliefs. We need to know, our consumers need to know, they need to believe that the way we treat animals in farming systems is based on a shared core belief about how animals should be treated. So we need to understand today's consumer. We need to understand the audience. And again, I think Charlie laid a great foundation. And as he mentioned, with all consumers, we face the constant battle that within 10 minutes in an iPad, you know, they've Googled their way into oblivion and I get a phone call asking me if all of our cows that we buy milk from are out on pasture, okay? So, we need to understand that. With today's consumer, we said to, earlier today, transparency is almost passe, it's a given. Transparency is fundamental. That's where we've gotten to. The new expectation beyond that is that we're authentic and honest. Why? Because they don't really trust much of what we have to say. So we're going to have to prove it. Everything we say we're going to do, we're going to have to follow up with evidence, and we're going to have to prove it. The last two years, I've had a great opportunity to work with uh, a lot of customers. And I've kind of decided I, I can lump our customers into two um, broad categories. Um, the first one is what I call the box checker. The box checker simply asks, are you doing something? They call me up and say, what are you doing about animal welfare? And I could probably say just about anything, and they'll hang up the phone and fill out their box and turn in their sheet to their boss and they'll be fine. And these are the same kind of customers that again, Google their way into questions and we have a battle of, of understanding what the issues are in animal welfare. The second customer is the kind of customer that I really actually enjoy dealing with. Or the, what I call the driver, okay? These are customers that actually are pretty savvy in animal welfare. These customers read the literature. These customers are well aware of what he already talked about today. They know what animal welfare looks like. They've established animal advisory councils. They invite people like Ruth to come give them advice. And they're addressing the issue. They want to set standards. They want to make sure that they're doing the right thing. But they also recognize that they're going to have to prove it. When I work with these drivers, what are their concerns? Their biggest concern is that of all the programs that are out there today, they really represent nothing more than window dressing. They will not advance welfare, and they will not provide the kind of brand protection they're looking for. And really, it almost sets them up for failure. Sometimes they think it's better to do nothing at all than to do what's put in front of them. So what they're looking ahead is saying, we need something more. We need leadership. When it comes to animal welfare, what does leadership look like? In an animal welfare program, that looks like documented continuous improvement, action plans that are written, follow-up. 
if we see something that we're not comfortable with or that needs to be improved, that we go back and we show that we've addressed the problem or that we're in the process of addressing it. They want on-site visits of farms of their choosing, okay? And they do want prohibited practices. There will be absolutes. There must be absolutes. And they're right. Why? Because today animal welfare programs tend to focus on the process rather than the outcome. Again, many programs have catered to niche markets, making judgments on production systems driven by ideology rather than focusing on the welfare of the cow. Now, a process-driven approach is useful in some of the respects of building a program. When we talk about tail docking, pain mitigation for dehorning. And so we need to develop best practice, best management guidelines. We also need to look at what are the right outcome measures and how do we use them. The problem is simply going to a farm, counting lame cows and telling, how telling them how many lame cows they have doesn't actually fix the problem. The fact is, the evidence would tell us that animal welfare programs, as they are managed today, have done nothing to improve the welfare of cows. And I thought that's what we were trying to do. Some of them address the bottom end, if you're talking niche markets who exclude people from a market. But I want to know, how do we improve the welfare of the national herd? How do we move the average to the right? Not just deal with the bottom end. Because remember, we like to go out there and claim the claims that we make in animal welfare programs is we're going to demonstrate and verify that they are committed to providing the highest standards of animal care. I'm not exactly sure what the highest standards look like, but I'm pretty sure it's not defined at the average. So how do we move the needle for the whole herd? This brings me to the next topic, leadership. Leadership is what I expect of myself, it's what we should expect of our industry, and of the veterinary profession. That makes us not only responsible people, it makes us good stewards. In the eyes of our customers, what does leadership look like? Again, there's lots of programs out there that are sort of based on checking boxes. Some are even self-reporting. I find those a little frustrating because I have yet to find anybody when I ask them if they feed colostrum to all their bull calves that will actually tell me no. Based on the national data, I know that there are several who don't. How many of you, if I asked you personally, Dale, are you doing a good job? Are you going to sit there and go like, well, Jim, <laughs> actually, I really haven't been doing that great. Okay? So self-reporting isn't really going to do us much good. Okay? So if we're saying we're doing it, we better be ready to prove it. We're going out there and assessing welfare, and we're saying we're committed to the highest level of care, we better be able to provide the evidence. And who writes these programs anyway? Who set these standards? Are we really setting standards that represent the highest level of care? Is allowing 10% lameness the highest level of care? I don't know if I can sell that. I talked to a, who I would consider a leader in the ag industry recently, and he told me, he said, Jen, you know what? The problem with the industry setting its own standards is that they get a bunch of producers and their favorite veterinarians in the room, and they codify what they consider to be normal practice today and call that improving welfare. I think he was right. That's not improving welfare or solving the problem. That's burying your head in the sand and becoming stagnant and irrelevant. Do we visit a farm to determine that animals are cared for properly? Or if they're cared for properly? We seem to have already decided what we're going to find on a farm before we get there. And we're telling people that it's all right. Because we're assuring consumers that the guidelines are met. The guidelines are less than 10% layman's. Yet our national data tells us that 23% of our cows are lame. 
I don't know how to have that conversation. Okay? So we need to be very careful about what we say and what we promise we're going to achieve. Okay? So don't make promises you can't keep. Here's a great example of what happens when you overpromise. And gets, this gets to the meat of the, rep, the rest of the presentation. How we actually manage to create risk rather than mitigate it. The Pork Quality Assurance Program helps to ensure that all animals in the pork industry receive humane care and handling. I wouldn't assure anything about all the animals and herds that I work with. All? That's a pretty big promise. Okay? And they got sued about it because you have to be careful about your words. Do I think that farmers try their best every day? Do I think farmers are making best efforts? I do. And I think it's okay to say that. I'm not telling our customers that our farmers are perfect. I'm not perfect. But I don't need to set us up for failure in the process. Learn from our mistakes the success and failures of others, that pretty much goes to the last slide. Again, not making over promises. Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Simply put, animal welfare programs today have been designed to make consumers happy and farmers happy. What can we do to make the consumers feel good while not getting the farmers too upset? Until a program actually puts the cow at the center of the conversation, we're going to end up back in the same position every time. We need to allow the animal welfare experts to define what is or isn't important to the cow and what is essential in animal welfare programs. Until then, these programs will be continued to be viewed as industry driven, having no real teeth, at best not effective, and at worst not genuine. Tail docking is a great example of that. The common cry that we've talked today from agriculture is that we want guidelines that are science-based. Some of the programs even claim that the science-based guidelines need to be enforced. And then I get handy-dandy little talking points that we're supposed to use if we're asked questions about the industry. And if someone asks me about tail docking, this is what I'm supposed to say. Some dairy farmers crop the tails of their animals to promote cleanliness similar to what people do in some breeds of dogs. Some farmers find that tail docking prevents eye and face injuries for dairy farm workers. When performed properly under anesthesia, 90% of them are done without anesthesia, the procedure has limited impact on the animal's comfort and no negative impact on the safety or quality of milk. That also has no positive impact, but they don't mention that. Yet, the AVMA, ABP, National Mastitis Council, Canadian Code of Practice, each expressly oppose the routine tail docking of dairy cattle based on the welfare implications to the cow. Illegal in California, being phased out in Ohio, tail docking is simply not an acceptable practice. So why are we just merely discouraging it? Is this the best we can muster? Are these really focused on improving the welfare of the cow? I'm happy to say that National Milk has recently shared that their board has decided that they will phase out tail dock over a 10 year period. Okay? Again, if we're gonna tell people we're committed to the highest <coughs> level of care, we need to own it and live up to it. We don't get to cherry pick the science when it suits us. If we want to live by the science, this is what the science tells us. Okay? These welfare programs don't have to be complicated. But how do I farm, uh, assure that a farm gets better? Admit when you're wrong and stop making excuses. Okay? When these videos come out, it's like Charlie said today, don't make excuses for the bad video. Just say, that wasn't all right. Okay? And, and then, let's come up with a plan to not let it happen again. We haven't been able to do that. 
I think in front of us we have a tremendous opportunity not only to maintain trust, but to build it. This is an opportunity to shape our legacy as an industry. We have a, a chance to choose between a legacy of complacency and passivity or a legacy of compassion and integrity. And why, again, why does this matter? Well, remember what we're trying to accomplish, risk mitigation. Again, from a corporate perspective, it's about doing the right thing. But it's no longer enough to simply say you're doing the right thing. You have to prove it. So here's your definition of risk management. Okay. If you look at that, you read the asterisk, it says risk can come from uncertainty of financial markets, project failures, blah, 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 legal liabilities, as well as a deliberate attack from the adversaries. Well, I'm beginning to think that we didn't read the asterisk when we looked at and developing these, these programs. Legal liabilities and attacks. How do we get ourselves in these situations? We've either forgotten or failed to realize one simple thing. The words matter. We've forgotten what poets and shamans and healers have known for millennia. That the simple difference between a curse and a blessing is words. Words matter. They're the servants of vision and the essential ingredient in every human, everything we've ever created or accomplished. They matter not just because they help us describe specific ideas. They matter because they have the power to actually transfer an entire belief system to someone else. And like Charlie said today, once they're out there, they sort of erect this wall of truth that everybody takes as absolute. What happens when somebody peeks behind the curtain? What happens when we've gotten everyone to believe that we're doing everything to the highest level of care. And we're assuring that all the animals are cared for properly. And they look behind the curtain and they find out, well, that wasn't exactly what we meant to say. Sometimes I look at what we put out there and I do have to wonder if we're doing ourselves any favors. Why? Because I guarantee that, that someone's going to look behind the curtain. And I think we all know who they are. Okay? A network of over a thousand pro bono attorneys and dozens of active cases, the HSUS has the largest animal protection litigation program in the country. So to go down this road and develop an animal welfare program and think that it's not going to be scrutinized and looked at is kidding ourselves. So whatever we do, we need to be very clear about what we're trying to accomplish and honest about what we can accomplish. Okay? I already mentioned that poor quality assurance was sued. Did we learn? Apparently not. Tyson sued, again, making broad statements about what their animal welfare program can achieve. Apparently what they meant to say, because this is the new version on the website, is we purchase beef and most of our pork from independent suppliers. We have less control of these animals, well-being prior to processing, but we strive to ensure their well-being. That's honest. Okay? We strive to ensure their well-being. I can back that up. You can read the rest. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Others are, still aren't getting it. I found it interesting this reporter um, called them out on, on, on this excellent point. The important lesson for managers here is that when you're trying to play in the consumer trend, it's best to either do it all the way or not at all. Half measures and weak industry generated standards aren't going to fly and may come back to bite you. So again, we have a great opportunity in the dairy industry to look at our standards and develop them keeping in mind the challenges, these challenges we face and what we're really trying to accomplish. 
Okay? Making big promises. Consistency and uniformity to best practices. Now, if I'm a consumer and I read this, that tells me that everybody feeds their cows the same way, milks their cows the same way, dehorns their cows the same way, raises their cows the same way. I don't think we want this for the industry, but if I'm a consumer who knows nothing about the dairy industry, that's what I might walk away from it and think everybody's supposed to do it the exact same way. So are we setting ourselves up for an awkward conversation and accusations? Are we meeting the guidelines or are we making best efforts? And if you're not, what does that mean? What are the consequences? Are there any absolutes? Does everybody get a claim participation that they're meeting the guidelines? So what are my concerns? And why hasn't Dean kind of jumped all in on any one program? Simply put, I don't think they're a safe bet. I don't think they accomplish what we're trying to do and I think they create more risk than they mitigate. I think they're currently designed to make producers happy or consumers happy. I don't think we've provided nearly enough education for the people who are doing assessments or audits. Education for the farmer. We need to spend a lot of time just communicating what our expectations are to the farmer. It's no, it's no fair to show up to a farm and give him a test if he didn't even know what the material was. There's a tremendous need for outreach and education. There's a lot of farms who didn't even know some of these things that we're, we're talking about. Accountability for continuous improvements. I think for any respectable animal welfare program, there's going to have to be some absolutes. Otherwise, it's kind of a moot point. We need to work on the right outcome measures. We need to make sure that we're not ignoring an entire life stage on the farm. Currently, most, most programs just focus on lactating cows. I think calf health and welfare is probably one of our biggest challenges that we need to make sure we're addressing and helping farmers improve. Do we have the complete picture of welfare? And I think Ruth introduced this great. I, I mentioned at the beginning that I really believe the most profound effect we have on the welfare of dairy cows on a day in and day out basis is stockmanship. I don't know that we have a good way to measure it yet. But we need to find something, okay? So this is what I do generally when I'm on the farm. I have our guys sit down and I try to see how long it takes the cows to turn around and start coming up to me. And those of you who work on farms, you all know, when you go into a barn and you see cows hightailing it to the other end, you know something's wrong, okay? I don't know how to measure it yet. We're talking about broken tails, maybe looking at that, okay? But surely stockmanship has the most profound effect on a day-to-day -day basis for the cow. What do I think we can do? I think we can verify that animals, or if animals are cared for and properly, and that producers strive to meet contemporary standards. We can identify areas that need attention or improvement, make sure that we develop plans and implement them, and we can set benchmarks. We can educate and inform and try to get them moving in that right direction. We can try to get them to move that curve to the right. When we look at programs, again, why do programs fail? Well, if they're not inherently flawed to begin with, I would say that they fail because of people. Because everything happens through people. So, and this includes all of us. And so that's where I think it's going to be key moving forward. Once we start looking at these programs, taking them onto the farm, working with people, getting them to accept them and adopt them and understand that it's really a benefit throughout the entire supply chain, how critical it is that when we do these programs, we do it with integrity. We do it right when no one's looking. Okay? So with that, I'll end it with this little quote and hopefully I've finished in time to allow any questions. So thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and I'll let the next person go.